And I want to thank you all for joining the second presentation of our MSPCA Angel Giving Day. This is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts, enforcing laws to keep animals safe and healthy. The MSPCA's law enforcement program comprises uniformed officers who cover all parts of Massachusetts and respond to many hundreds of cruelty and neglect complaints every year. And as you are about to hear, we do this in many ways. Our ability to prosecute according to the Massachusetts Animal Cruelty Statute is granted by our state's governor. Our officers wear badges, they carry guns, and they can arrest or file charges on those who harm animals. Our officers also serve as a vital links to emergency veterinary care, pet food relief, and counseling services that work to keep animals safe and healthy and at home with families that love them. Tom Grenham, director of our law enforcement team, joins us now to tell you more about this incredible work. And what I just wanna say is, Tom, thank you for joining us at the very last minute. For those of you who may not be aware, we were scheduled to have a member of Tom's team make this presentation, but she had a last minute emergency and Tom was grateful, gra gracious enough to join us and, and, and make the presentation for us. So with that, Tom, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Allie, can you um, start the slide deck for me? So what I'm gonna do over the next 20 minutes or so is give you a bit of an overview of law enforcement. I'm gonna tell you a bit about our law enforcement department, um, how we're set up as Neil just kind of went over. I'll give you a little background on myself um, and where I came from before I got here to the MSPCA. I'll give you an idea of a typical day in the life of an MSPCA officer. And I'll also go over a couple of larger cases or very busy times where we had to send resources to multiple locations um, over a short period of time. And uh, we'll close out with a couple of those examples uh, of the cases that I just discussed. So, and then at the end, um, Rob will set up some questions. So uh, I look forward to, from, to hear from all of you. Um, Ali. So just quickly at a glance, you see a little photo of us down there. We have eight sworn officers. So we have eight police officers and we have four non-sworn or civilian staff that assist us within our department. Um, we are spread out. I am, as Neil said, the director of law enforcement. Uh, we have a deputy director who assists me and we go out and supervise all over the state. Um, to different large cases. The way we're split up, we have a sergeant who covers Western Mass. We have an officer who lives and covers Central Mass. We have an officer uh, who was supposed to do the presentation today who does all of the Metro Boston area. We have an officer up in the North Shore. We have an officer in the South Shore and we have the Cape and the Islands. So that's how we break up the state and have our officers respond to different calls and assist other agencies and animal control organizations. Um, you've probably heard a lot recently about police reform and POST. POST is now oversees all of law enforcement. We are included in POST and are currently training three of our officers who still need to have what's called the Bridge Academy, um, finish the Bridge Academy and get up to be certified and meet all of the POST standards. We're right on track for that and that is moving forward very well. We as law enforcement officers, our primary goal whenever we can is to keep people and their animals together, be that through education, um, be that through assistance or working within and outside of our organization to get people the resources they need. That is our goal. There are times when that's not enough and we have to perhaps charge people or take out charges in court for animal cruelty, which is a felony. So we are authorized to uh, make arrests. We also summons people in. Uh, we can do search warrants. We file these charges. But again, our biggest thing is we, we have that civilian staff, which I'll get into a little bit more, who goes out and delivers food or delivers 
different items that people need who are in need, who can't afford to do it themselves. So as I said, our primary goal is to keep people and their animals together and we do everything we can to do that. Allie? So me at a glance, I'm, I'm entering my 38th year of law enforcement. Uh, I started in local law enforcement in my uh, hometown. I grew up in Avon and that's where I started part-time again, almost 38 years ago. I then went uh, and was employed by the state as a police officer uh, for 30 plus years. Before coming here to the MSPCA in 2018, I love the idea of this mission. I, I, I really love the organization and uh, look forward to coming and helping people uh, and, and forwarding what we do here at MSPCA uh, every day. So in addition to being a police officer, um, I am on the board of directors of another private nonprofit and the MSPCA is very supportive of me being on this board of directors. I am on, uh, you can see from this photo here, I'm doing a check presentation, but I'm on the board of directors for an organization, Cops for Kids with Cancer. And we give checks, usually 40,000 a month, uh, eight, eight different families get $5,000 from us to do what they need to do to better their lives if their child is fighting cancer. So that's near and dear to me. I have a daughter who is a leukemia survivor who was diagnosed when she was three. Um, she's now a sophomore in college and, and doing very well. So in my spare time or other than being in the, in, in the police department and working for a private nonprofit, um, I do a lot of work outside of it through Cops and Kids with Cancer. Allie? So a typical day for law enforcement. How do complaints come into us? Because we're we're not your typical law enforcement department that has a specific area or a town or the state where we have a desk officer sitting where people can walk into our to our police station. That's not how we work. Our, we do have our own office. It's at Angel, MSPC Angel in uh, Jamaica Plain. And we get our complaints mostly from um, people who call in uh, or send emails or things like that. But complaints can come in anonymously uh, online directly to our officers or through our animal welfare agents or office administrator who takes in these calls as we call dispatch, and then they dispatch them out via email, text, or phone call. So a typical officer will have multiple things come in a day. There's a different number as you can imagine in law enforcement. Some days are busier than others. Uh, and we always have plenty of things to do and reserve rechecks from previous cases and the like that the officers plan in advance and then very similar today where uh, Officer Sula had an emergency and I step in, if something happens, our officers, although they cover specific parts of the state, we go anywhere we need to go and cover for each other. We also get a lot of calls from district attorneys and organizations looking to, for assistance or guidance from us, be it our own cases or other, or other cases. So we're on the phone a lot, coordinating things with the courts and other agencies. We regularly um, collaborate with local police departments, local animal control officers. And certainly, as you can imagine, we work very closely with our own hospital adoption center, clinics, and everything else within animal welfare to do what we can do, um, be it investigation or assistance uh, day to day. We have things called rechecks, which I kind of explained to you before. So a recheck is just, I go, we go to a certain property, we make suggestions for improvement. We ask them if they need any assistance from us, and then we'll set something up, be it whatever the case requires um, a following week or a couple of weeks later, and we'll see how things have progressed at that location. Allie. So how do we make an impact in law enforcement? Certainly through education. Right. So we are not just about enforcing the laws. Certainly we do that. But as I said earlier, what is our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal is to assist people and work with people to keep them and their animals together. So whenever we can do that, that's what we do. We do that a lot through education. And we do that a lot through assistance. So what resources can we offer? And a lot of that is through our adoption centers where they end up helping us um, 
with with assisting these different people that we meet out in the field. So we can offer low cost spay and neuter to people who can't afford to do it or can't afford the full price of doing it. We can offer uh, assistance in getting vaccines, for example. Our animal welfare agents who aren't police officers, but help us not only answer the phones, but go out to non-criminal cases and deliver things like kitty litter, food, some type of crate, toys, different things that we think will help um, people and their pets. So in addition, as I said, to just being people look at us as law enforcement officers, we, we use all the resources available to us and our knowledge to educate and assist people uh, every day in any way we can. Okay, Ali. So, examples of cases. We had a couple of significant surrenders in a short amount of time uh, in the last week of December. We've talked about this a bit within our organization because we had a very busy year last year, both the uh, adoption center and law enforcement. In one particular week, we were out um, in Western Mass working on a case in Alfred, which is on the New York border. And there were a large amount of horses on two different pieces of property with the same owner. Uh, after some education and working with them, they realized they could not handle all of these horses. And we had to arrange to have 18 of them were surrendered to us, and we had to arrange to have them not only corralled, loaded, transported from Western Mass up to our farm, all the way up in Methuen, which is about a three hour ride with the trailer and everything else. This took an immense amount of training because these horses were on a quarantine, which means the Mass Department of Agriculture, because some of the horses were sick and they were intermingled, um, they were all considered quarantined, so they couldn't be around other animals. So we had to, with the uh, Adoption Center and the Nevin staff, come up with a, a um, large plan to not only remove 18 horses, but before doing that, we had to clear the horses out that were up in Methuen and have them transported to other locations, because again, we couldn't move these animals that were under quarantine and mix them in with the animals that were up there. So we were on a Zoom, similar to this, trying to plan this all out. And in the middle of the Zoom, we got called up to Fitchburg in which there was a house with 30 American bullies in it that weren't in the best of conditions. And those animals also had to be removed. So while planning for this big event, which we did on a Monday with the horses, this large call came in right in the middle of our call and we had to dispatch someone out there and 16 of those dogs ended up coming here to MSPCA. Go ahead, Allie. So this is an example of the horses. When you um, think about removing animals, and this was certainly something as I came here that enlightened me, is the amount of staff and people it takes and the amount of organization to make sure the animals are removed safely. Um, obviously, all of the people that are there working on it uh, and removing the animals um, do it safely and all leave there safely. Um, we had to organize outside agencies to come with trailers, stock trailers and things to assist us. And the conditions were extremely wet and muddy. So it took all day long. It took us, for the most part, eight hours to load five trailers full of horses from two different locations. As I said, they were side by side and an immense amount of coordination. We had to shut the roads down. So we had to use the local and state police out there in Western Mass to assist us. And obviously we would like to do all of this during daylight. So to get it all done, get them loaded during daylight, get them transported three hours, almost three hours away and then unloaded. And again, do it as in uh, safe manner as possible. Took a lot, took a lot of coordination, took a lot of time, um, a lot of patience. And certainly we can't, these cases, when you have to take care of, you can imagine 18 horses, we need veterinary care, we need to feed them, we need to have their um, feet done and their teeth loaded, all those kind of things. Um, the staff that we hire and, and everything, certainly given this presentation on Giving Day, I'm, I'm 
so happy to be here because we can't do it without people who um, donate so that we can keep up this work and help as many people and animals as possible. Allie. So um, again, as Neil said, I was a pinch hitter here last minute. Um, I wanted to make sure I was able to, to speak to this presentation, um, uh, hopefully uh, enlighten you to a little bit of a day in the life of a police officer. Um, thank everybody who is uh, a, does donate to us and supports us in any way. We, we really can't do it without you. Tom, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'll remind folks that if you have any questions, you can answer, you can pose the question in the chat box here or on our social media. We have folks who are monitoring that and we'll ask these questions of Tom. Tom, I think what was so wonderful about the presentation is it helps to really clarify what we do and what we don't do. And on the what we do part of this, um, I hope it's very heartwarming for people on the line to hear that we're such a critical conduit to resources they may need, whether it's pet food or low or no cost spay and neuter to bring down the homeless pet population or primary veterinary care that some people otherwise wouldn't be able to afford. So that not only do we arrest these situations, we stop these situations before there is animal cruelty, but we keep most importantly pets at home and happy and healthy with the people who love them. So Thanks for really emphasizing that part of it. It's wonderful. And it leads us to the first question. So someone asks uh, about resources available in Essex County. Very specific. Thanks for the question. And maybe to be of service to everyone on the line, we could broaden that out a little bit, Tom. Could you expand a bit on the kinds of resources that are generally available across the 300 plus cities and towns, which ultimately were responsible for blanketing in some way, and what people should do if they do need resources? Yeah, so we I'll start with our internal resources. So first, what we would reach out to is we would go to our different adoption centers, be it on the Cape Cod, Boston, Salem, or, or up in Methuen. So whatever's closest, that's where we would get our supplies of the food, the kitty litter, to set up the uh, vaccines or the low-cost spare neuter. We work hand-in-hand -hand there with the adoption center. If it's a portion of the state that it would be harder for the people to get to one of our locations, then we certainly work hand in hand with, um, with other organizations that the adoption centers especially end us work with, and they will assist us. We can go there and get assistance from them. So it's, it, I wouldn't say by county or county, we, we certainly have the resources available anywhere in the state. It's, and again, our animal welfare agents, a lot of times people can't get to us, they can't drive, We'll go out, we'll pick up their animal, we'll bring it in, let's say to get groomed or whatever the case may be, get their nails done, and then we'll deliver the animal back. So um, multiple resources available, both internal and external. That's really helpful. And I just reiterate that if people are in need or someone who uh, is asking that question because they know of someone who might need resources, you can always contact the MSPCA. MSPCA.org has quite a bit of contact information for both our law enforcement and other teams. And we're here to help out as needed. Um, question about wildlife. I always love these questions, right? Because for all of us, you know, drawing this gradation on a line can be very challenging in situations where we are able to help um, or unable to help and may want to. So in the case of sick or injured, abandoned wildlife, which of course we get plenty of calls on, what do we do first when we get those calls about wildlife in trouble? So a lot of that we coordinate with the environmental police. So the environmental police does a lot with the wildlife. Uh, you know, sometimes we see they need to relocate a bear, for an example, that comes down, then they tranquilize it, and they remove it. That's not something that we have the capability to do. So a lot of the wildlife calls, although we'll assist, are handled by the environmental police. Certainly, if there's cruelty to the wildlife, we can charge for that, as can the environmental police. So depending on the situation there, we will certainly work with whomever we have to to address um, the situation. Very helpful. Um, question about uh, local police departments. We get this question a lot, too. I think um, I get this question from journalists, right? What are the situations under which the MSPCA would be involved versus, say, a local police department. And it doesn't really seem like it's 
codified or necessarily formal, right? It's when someone has a complaint and they call, usually they call who they're thinking of first. And it could be their local police department and it could be us. And it seems like from there, uh, one of those two agencies would start the follow-up on the case. If I'm wrong on that, I'll give you a moment to clarify. But more to this person's question, um, when we're unable to assist in a case in a particular town, do we offer education and guidance to police departments? In other words, share what we know because we're the animal people, right? We know animal law really, really well and we know humane handling really well. What kind of training or counsel goes into that from our end when a local police department is looking into animal cruelty? I love this question because we were lucky enough a couple of years ago, um, all police officers, all local police officers from the rank of patrolman through chief were required to take a three hour animal cruelty investigation class. And we were a core part of the group along with the um, attorney general's office, our partners at ARL, we put together this three hour training and we trained the trainers. We went to the class, uh, we trained the trainers within and some of our officers are trainers within the academy and they continue to teach this. So all local officers that were on at the time from patrolman through chief have had animal cruelty training, a three hour block. We developed a handbook which broke down all of the laws and statutes and resources that officers can use. We handed them out at the academy. So a lot of them have them right in the glove compartment of their police cruisers that they can refer to. And regardless of whether the local police, some cases that happen, the local police can handle very easily on their own. Um, other times they'll call us for assistance and we'll always talk and give assistance to local police departments. Um, other people call us directly. We still fill in the local police departments because we want to make sure we always keep communication open and that we are all on the same page of what's going on. So it's not as important who gets the call. Certainly call your local police with it. A lot of them um, can investigate these cases, and that's what we want. We need more people doing it. Obviously, six officers can't handle the whole state, and that's what we have on the street. Um, but we do work hand in hand, and there's a lot more knowledge out there uh, amongst police officers on how to investigate these cases since we since we developed and gave this training at the academy. That's so helpful. Thank you. And I hope that's in service to the question that was asked too. It sounds like it is. Um, Tom, let's get a little specific there because this is a question I often hear about and multiple people are asking about it. Animal control. I think we all assume that every town has an animal control officer. And of course, that's certainly not the case. Can you paint a picture generally of animal control coverage in Massachusetts? Like what areas of the state do you think are pretty light in terms of animal control? Um, which areas of the state you think are fairly well covered? And then in addition to that, can you help us understand what should we do first if we have a cruelty uh, complaint? Should we contact our local animal control? Should we contact the MSPCA? Do we call everyone? Maybe a little bit more clarity on that would be helpful. Sure. So let me say whenever you think there's something that needs to be dealt with immediately, it's an emergency, then you call 911, you call your local police department. They're the ones that are going to be closest. They're the ones that are going to res respond. If it's a call, let's say, that comes in over the weekend that you believe can wait and you, you want to give us a call on it, or during the day, you call us if it's not an emergency. Certainly, we'll go out and assist the police departments if there's an emergency, but there are times we won't have an officer in that area. So always, always in, during the emergency, call the local police. Um, animal control. So everyone's a little bit different, and each part of the state is different. And I think you can all imagine during COVID, be it any any. Um, any place in the job workforce is fighting for people, is losing people, is replacing people, is having trouble. So most places have animal control uh, or they have a regional type animal control. Uh, if they don't, some of the police officers will, will call us. But an example of animal control compared to police, right? So we already kind of multiple times had called the police an emergency. I don't think we can say that enough. If you have a nuisance complaint, right? A barking dog. Um, uh, and, and unless there's extreme weather, a dog that's outside too long, 
Um, again, if it's extreme weather, that turns into emergency, right? Um, those are the times you will try and deal with your animal control officers. And that's a bit of the difference between animal control and us. We work hand in hand, but we don't do as many, uh, we don't do the barking dogs, that type of complaints that, that, um, th that would go through animal control. And, and those really shouldn't go to the police department either, uh, unless there's no animal control on, uh, then, you, then you would call the police department. Uh, if an animal control officer is going on vacation and we work with them a lot and they say, hey, I'm gonna be off. Can I have my chief call you guys if we have a problem? We work hand in hand and we'll certainly work um, work with animal control in that aspect and make sure that we're available um, to assist in any way that we can. That's very helpful. Some of the training you talked about earlier in the presentation, particularly the humane training that we've done for police officers, will that ultimately be extended to animal control? Can it be? So we teach in the animal control officers have an academy going right now. And a week ago, Friday, we were just out there. They asked our Sergeant from Western Mass, uh, Bill Loisel, to do a three hour block on field and ACO officer safety. Um, so we are teaching in that academy also. Um, we have um, two of our officers, one of our sergeants, one of our officers that teaches in there. I was lucky enough to be present for his presentation last Friday. Um, so yes, both animal control officers and police officers get a block um, from us in animal cruelty. Okay, that's great. And then just to put a finer point on animal control, everyone always has a lot of questions about animal control because it's a little bit of a mysterious function, right? I think we all grew up with animal control as being kind of the dog catcher, but certainly animal control is in a much more sort of progressive front now, right? In terms of humane handling and being a, a real collaborator with us and also their local police and in some cases working within the local police departments. But do you have a, a feel for, or help us understand the specific mission that animal control typically has in a city or town and how that's different from our law enforcement mission? So, yes. So some animal control officers come under the police department. They're, they're under, and some come under um, board of health. So they don't all come under the police department each city or town may have them differently. Some animal control officers have police powers and some do not. So there's just not one mix or one, one way to describe how each uh, animal control officer's job is and what authority they have or not. So usually anything animal related, the animal control officer will get called to if they have to remove animals, hold animals, uh, respond, as I said, to some of these calls or, or some violations. Um, and the biggest difference between them and us is that we mainly, mainly try to concentrate on assisting with the animal, animal cruelty investigations. So those are the part that we can really bring the expertise into. Um, the the day-to-day -day town operations of things that happen, again, in removal of animals or assisting animals or things like that, or going to, going to the, I, again, I, I'm calling them nuisance type calls. I don't mean to, that they're important to be dealt with, but certainly that's a lot of the function of the animal control officer, in addition to working with the police uh, and us in any animal related call. Great, very helpful. Tom, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. That's all the questions. If someone does sneak a question in at the end and uh, we get cut off, don't worry. We have a chat record. So we'll do our best to reach back out to people to answer any questions that we may miss here. Uh, thank you all for joining. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Neil. Yeah, and I and I really, Tom, just want to echo Rob's comments. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was really a privilege to have you share your insights with us.